Good morning, everybody. So I just want to make a full disclosure that I am not a researcher. I am not a scientist. You won't see a p-value. You won't see any data. Don't be disappointed for the next 20 minutes, please. Um, but if you do go online and you try and search any publications, what you're going to come up with me, the best I can offer is you'll come up with some cricket scores from, um, from South Africa when I played. So that's the best I can offer from uh, a scientific perspective. So um, I think before I get started, I want to uh, say that I'm really thrilled that we are going to be having a workshop this afternoon about storytelling. Uh, because I'm going to start my presentation with telling uh, a story about three little girls. Oh, actually, three little kids. One's a boy and two of them are girls. All right, so we're going to start with uh, our first vaccination journey in my attempt to try and talk about resilience. And uh, number one, I'm going to talk to you about a little boy from Sweden. His name is Anders. That's what Anders looks like. So... He lives with his parents and a little sister in Stockholm, Sweden. Anders has received all recommended vaccines to date and will get his second dose of MMR when he turns six in Sweden. The MMR vaccine rate is 97%, as uh, Madeline told us yesterday. And then Anders' parents are assured that when he goes to preschool and plays with his little sister and friends, he's not likely to be exposed to measles. And even if he is, he'll likely be protected. In Sweden, stakeholders are aligned in their messaging and support of our vaccination. The government and healthcare authorities reacted quickly to recent measles cases to contain the virus and ensure that MMR vaccines were broadly available. Anders has a promising future and one in which he is likely to be protected against numerous vaccine preventable diseases. So second, I'll tell you the story of Rose. Rose is also four years old and lives about two hours outside of Manila. Rose had her first dose of MMR vaccine when she was 18 months old and received other pediatric vaccines as recommended. However, her parents have heard negative press about vaccines in the past year or so. In fact, they are considering not getting any additional vaccines for Rose for fear that vaccines aren't safe. Unfortunately, the Philippines, including Rose's community, is facing one of the biggest measles outbreaks, as we just saw, uh, in the world. Confidence in vaccines is low, despite the authorities' efforts to reassure the public and encourage vaccination. Rose's future, therefore, is less certain, and she may be vulnerable to vaccine-preventable diseases. And then lastly, I'll tell you the story of little Grace, who lives in Clark County, Washington State, and is also four years of age. She has received some vaccines, but has not yet received a dose of MMR vaccine, as her parents are vaccine hesitant and up till recently hadn't believed that measles was a real health threat. Grace's parents are hearing a lot of media coverage about the current measles outbreak, which has affected approximately 70-odd individuals, mostly children, in their community this year, resulting in hundreds of uh, school-going children not going to school and staying at home for weeks to limited exposure to the disease. Yet, Grace's parents think they can protect her from measles by keeping her away from groups of children. They're still unsure about vaccinating and will probably just wait to see what happens. So these stories uh, that I related to you, uh, these characters are fictional, but the environment that I described around these little children is very real because that's exactly what some of them are faced with. Not only that, when you think about social media, if you think about um, the way news travels, I think recently uh, in an M MIT uh, study, it was a very small study, and it just focused on one channel, it was Twitter. They established that negative news or misinformation travels approximately six times faster than positive information. And that we've seen, you know, if it if it bleeds, it leads. We know how it operates. And unfortunately, that's the case even within channels where there's really no restrictions, no control, no regulatory uh, issues that people have to contend with. And that's what it results is that. So think about the environment. In addition to that, think about the social media that the parents and others are faced with and how they contend with that. I won't go too deep into uh, the um, tech companies and the steps that were taken. I think this was mentioned during the course of the, the meeting. 
Uh, but needless to say, the steps that are being taken are certainly steps in the right direction. Uh, on your left, what you see is examples of how that coverage was received and how it was uh, reported in the media. So while Amazon removes books for uh, promoting autism cures and vaccine misinformation, in reality, if you go to Amazon, you will still see information as recent as this month. So it's moving in the right direction, but it's far from where we should be in terms of the steps that have been taken. Same with Facebook, and I won't go into that, uh, as well as Instagram. What's critical, though, is to understand when we talk about things like digital learning, and I prefer calling it learning and not listening. I used the word listening once, and people translated that into spying. Uh, so, we, so we started calling it learning, uh, because I think that's, in fact, what it is. Uh, understanding the space better. Where are these conversations actually happening is critical. We tend to think about social media as just one big entity, but within social media, uh, the channels that are where conversations are occurring are critical. So in Turkey, for example, Instagram has just overtaken uh, Twitter. So you are, if you are targeting a particular population, target audience, going to Twitter is probably not the right place, but going to Instagram is. And it differs for different countries. So as part of our digital learning, uh, this is across uh, 20 countries. And many of the countries were actually mentioned in examples, including Denmark, uh, where we've tried to summarize some of the tactics that are being used. So on the left-hand side in the predominantly green color, you would see the tactics that pro-vaccination advocates use. On the right-hand side, you see the tactics that are typically used by uh, anti-vaxxers. So I'll try and summarize this, call out a few things. I think you know most of this because it was discussed during the course of the meeting. Um, if you look at the elements that anti-vaxxers or those that have come out against vaccine, vaccines, uh, again, the alleged adverse events that are talked about there is absolutely no restriction in how they talk about it, and people tend to just pile on. That is a very um, common trend. On the positive side, you really don't see that. I mean, I listened very carefully to so much good work, so many good papers, but how often do we support one another in actually getting the message out there? If somebody publishes, typically what happens, you, you know, may do an interview with a traditional outlet, maybe it's a top-tier outlet, maybe you'll post the link to social channel. But how many of our peers, how many of our colleagues actually support us in getting that message further out? It is limited, but it's getting better. With the anti-vaxxers and those that are trying to uh, contain this, basically what happens is no matter what the source, no matter what the information, no matter how old it is, everyone just piles on. As a result, you see a bigger storm. That's typically what happens. But we can do that more professionally. We don't have to behave that way, but we can do it in a way that supports our colleagues and peers around the world. Uh, and then I'll just mention the, the loss of freedom of choice. This is used very often, right? In, we have a channel. We can say what we like. You, you know, uh, please don't take that freedom away from us. Uh, typically, on the, the other side, you don't, you don't really see much of that. Uh, what you do see is a lot of scientific specific authorities engaging, which is great. More and more we're seeing voices that are credible, that are out there. Um, you see a lot of information, and I think our presenters earlier mentioned, that are put on social channels. Not necessarily in the best way, because I think one of the challenges we face is how do you convert the science and the data to information that people actually understand? How do you make sure that that resonates? That, I think, is a science in itself. Uh, often you'll see a lot of data-heavy information and facts out there. If you, are gonna, if you take a certain perspective in life and you are motivated emotionally in a certain direction, as we heard, facts are not going to change that. You really need to engage it a in a different manner. Um, and then lastly, uh, this may sound a little bit controversial, but I know this has been attempted, including from our perspective at uh, MSD, is we try to debunk the, the myths. Uh, and if you look at the cognitive uh, sciences and the social uh, biases, uh, that may not be a very good tactic because but even if we, the word myths and facts, right, what comes first? Myth. 
right? Because you try and debunk that. What happens is that you, all you're doing is you're reinforcing that. That negative terminology is being reinforced. And it's showing more and more that that approach is not working. So uh, it's something for us to think about, but it does happen. And then lastly, in the middle section, the overlapping section, and by the way, those arrows um, depict more or less the level or at which uh, these tactics are used. So if you see the two arrows pointing towards the red uh, piece in the middle, the shared tactics are on emotion. We are outnumbered by that. They do a far better job than advocates do, um, and it works. We know that it works. We're starting to see that emerge more and more on the on the uh, right. On sorry, on the left side, uh, and the more we can do that, the better. But that typically is a current picture of what we see today in the social channels. I want to mention very briefly the cognitive biases impacting vaccine hesitancy. So remember, these children and their parents uh, also have to deal with social norms, social uh, environments that they've been brought up in, very different. So if you take countries like Japan versus the U.S., we know stark differences in uh, how people are, uh, are brought up in the way they react to social uh, pressures. So firstly, availability bias. If you look on the extreme right, the more we can picture it, the more important it is. So, for example, what's motivating in, uh, with these children? Outbreaks, right? If you think about uh, uh, one of the girls where they saw outbreaks taking place, for example, in Washington State, that is a social bias, right? When they started to picture an outbreak versus not seeing any measles cases, then there's interest in, oh, maybe we should take some action. Very important. Optimism bias. So let's see, show of hands, how many of you played the lottery? Why do people play the lottery? You know the chances are so slim, right? You have better chance of being struck by lightning, but people take that chance. So optimism bias, people think they can beat the odds, and really, in effect, uh, it's a very, very slim chance. We routinely conform to the prevailing social norms. So take unders in Sweden, right? Social norms there, you could argue that vaccination coverage, that vaccination rates with pediatric vaccines are extremely high, 97, 98%. That is a social norm. So all they've done is, as a family, made a decision to comply with the norm. Whereas in some of the other, where there's pockets, the social norm may be the exact opposite, where they're starting to see trends in the reverse direction. Important. I'll say a quick word about framing, loss versus gain. I think this came up yesterday uh, in a, in a uh, uh, talk as well. So with, you know, I'll give an example that we've taken. We typically describe impact of vaccination as um, lives saved. How often have you heard in the pediatric uh, sphere, you're looking at about two to three million lives saved every year. How many people can really translate two to three million? Right? If you're not making as much as Angus makes in, uh, you know, two to three million is hard to understand. So <laughs> I'm joking, Angus. But typically, you know, we throw these big numbers out there, including some of the data that we put out there. It's very difficult for people to really understand that. We looked at a different angle. If you look at the loss frame, in t instead of talking about life saved, Think about what happens in the absence. So without vaccination or vaccinations, the world would have lost more boys, more girls, more scientists, more researchers, more doctors, more firemen to the size equivalent to the United States of America, about 350 million over the years, or five times the size of the population of France. It's a very different image in your mind than seeing a series of zeros. If you think, think about that impact of a loss frame, works two to three times better with audiences than a gain frame. So a tactic that we're starting to employ now is we talk about it in a different way completely. Um, we prefer taking no action rather than being the cause. So many parents, for example, are faced with, even though there's the slight chance that there may be an adverse event, I do not want to be that parent that made the decision for that to happen. So they, what, what ultimately happens is they don't take action. And then lastly, the only uh, view that we accept or the only facts or research that we accept are those that support our own viewpoint. And we see that over and over again. So 
As a result, we recognize that it takes a whole network of stakeholders, right? If you want to think about uh, resilience and building resilience in a immunization system, you need to think about the individuals and the communities and the biases that they are uh, faced with, the healthcare professionals in the health systems, the private sector, the policymakers, governments, and authorities. Everybody has a role to play. There is really no one size fits all, and the approach of one stakeholder who can singly handle hesitancy or build confidence or build resilience uh, is really a myth, if you, if you, if you like. Uh, a resilient system for us, what does it mean? It means one that can prevent or withstand major shocks and disruptions. A uh, good example is what happened in Japan with HPV. From a rate of about 70%, they dropped down to below 1%, and that's because there was not, they were not geared up, they were not prepared, they were, there was no action taken. In fact, there was a withdrawal of, uh, away from the issue, which just basically spiraled out of control. A good example is what Denmark uh, just mentioned. So that, that particular story, same product, same brand, same um, vaccine, different outcome, because the communities came together and operated as a partnership. So I'm going to take you through um, and uh, one, one other point. Let me just go back here for a second. When you think about uh, those that research and manufacture vaccines, I don't like to call it honestly an industry perspective because that may not be fair. There are many um, organizations within the industry. I also think industry has a, a negative con connotation. Uh, we often refer to as suppliers. Uh, we are not suppliers. We are researchers. We develop vaccines. We discover max vaccines. Uh, we also do rigorous uh, studies. We ensure safety, quality, the, every effort that goes into the vaccine. And then there's a supply, manufacturing, and then it's supply. So it's a whole continuum of basically what, uh, from our lens, what we need to do to ensure resilience. If you think about it, one of the issues that we faced with is maintaining a reliable supply. It's very difficult to do that. Vaccines are biologics. Vac biologics are difficult to manufacture. In, when, when we're faced with things like outbreaks, for example, um, with measles, uh, and we are not the only measles manufacturer, but certainly one of the manufacturers that have uh, MMR vaccine, for example, uh, it was very difficult to manage signals coming in from different countries all at the same time. Uh, because often people think there's enough vaccine to go around, and Typically, that's not the case because the planning starts three to four years ahead of actually when it gets to the country or gets into, the, uh, into an arm of a, of a child. Um, so that's part of the results. And if you, all the work that you guys are doing in this room uh, and your organizations are amazing, what has happened is it's created incredible demand. And we as uh, suppliers of the vaccine and manufacturers of the vaccine have to try and make sure we keep up working closely with organizations so when they signal us, at least we can plan ahead of time so that we meet those signals and those demands. Very, very uh, difficult to do, easier said than done. So let's take a look at uh, measles. I won't go into a lot because I think there was much said about this uh, already. Um, in Europe, there have been about 90,000 cases of measles to date this year, from 84,000 in all of 2018. Uh, and just recently, as you know, four countries lost their elimination status with measles. Uh, the UK, Albania, Czech Republic, and Greece. Uh, that was the recent, uh, recently reported by WHO. In the US, more than 12,000 cases have been reported since the start of this year, representing the highest number of cases reported in the US in any year since 1992. The ongoing outbreaks are testament to the fact that resilience continues to be tested, even when declarations have been made, and even in countries and communities with formerly high vaccination rates. So meeting those sporadic demands from our perspective is always going to remain a challenge. Uh, so that we can go back into the early stages of bulk ingredient that's going into vaccines and ramp up quickly so that we could try and meet those signals. And really taking into account the regulatory signals as well, right? Because the, the uh, uh, sorry, the regulations and the constraints around that as well. Because 
it's not easy to pivot. If, if a vaccine is manufactured for a particular country under their regulations, it, you can't take it and just uh, redirect it to another country. You have to go through a lot of regulations to get that passed. Uh, so just another uh, hurdle or barrier for us to deal with in the system. So these were some of the headlines around the measles outbreaks. Let me go back there for a second. Uh, touch on HPV just briefly. Uh, HPV, as an example, uh, I think is really unique in many ways. Uh, I, one of the questions I have for the, for the groups that are working on materials and communications is do you see HPV differently? Uh, because from our perspective, we've seen a huge difference. Even in cases or instances where there are high vaccination coverage rates, for example, in pediatric vaccines. Those same countries, those same systems, have been completely um, impacted by hesitancy when it comes to HPV. Uh, I think, you know, even, even the anti-vaxxer movements have dedicated sites that actually are branded. Uh, some of those brands look better than our brands, but there are several sites just on Gardasil. It's amazing how many of there uh, exist. Um, one thing that we are realizing is that there has been an incredible increase, unprecedented in many ways, of the uptake and the signals that, are we, that we are receiving with HPV. Uh, over a five-year period, we saw steady demand, which we were trying to meet, I think, reasonably well. And then suddenly, between 2017 and 28, that signal doubled in one year. It actually doubled, and we were struggling and are struggling still to keep up with that. Um, so again, thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, it's certainly, you know, creating more of a dem uh, demand signal, but it is also presenting a bit of a challenge for us to, to try and meet those. What we are doing, uh, just from an MSD perspective, uh, Merck perspective in the U.S., is we are constructing facilities uh, that will help catch up to that demand signal uh, and we think the time frame sh will be around 2023 when we actually catch up. Right now, there is a gap, and we're the first ones to admit that. I'll talk a little bit about, e about Ebola. Uh, since it was mentioned a couple of times, I, I think a really different set of challenges that we face when it comes to uh, resilience or even hesitancy for that matter. Um, it's certainly a, a global emergency that presents a whole new set of challenges for stakeholders working to fight some of the world's, world's most challenging global health threats. In 2014, we joined uh, the response, uh, and we, at the time, uh, did not have a vaccine. We do have one now. Uh, it's an investigational vaccine called V920, which is currently being used in the outbreak in the DRC. Um, now, that in itself presents quite a bit of a challenge. Uh, and I understand it's going to be ultimately uh, one of the big, biggest or largest clinical trials in history uh, based on the numbers that are actually out there and, and the recipients uh, receiving the vaccine. Uh, we did not have that vaccine in the 2013-14 outbreak, but we did have it in the 17 and then more recently the 18 outbreak, which is currently ongoing. So uh, I'll just give you a quick snapshot of the numbers uh, we're facing, fa focusing right now in terms of building resilience and trust on three areas. One is pre-licensure preparedness, and that comes with its own set of challenges because we can say absolutely nothing about the vaccine to uh, anybody outside of the company uh, because it is investigational and because we can no way promote it or say anything about it, even though it's in response to an outbreak and it's not going to be commercialized. Uh, same, same rules apply. Uh, secondly, the registrations. So we are working rapidly to obtain regulatory licenses and WHO pre-qualification, including accelerated registrations in some of the African countries that may be impacted by Ebola. And then lastly, post-licensure preparedness. If approved, supplying the vaccine to support future more permanent uh, stockpiles, for example, a comprise of the license is going to be important. So to date, we have shipped uh, 245,000 doses. Uh, of the investigational vaccine to the WHO. Uh, 226,000 plus have been vaccinated as part of this ongoing response. And additionally, we are working to have 650,000 dose equivalents ready in the next six to eight mo 18 months. Uh, because as you know, uh, even you know, recently, there were a lot of criticisms about access to 
uh, vaccines. We are thrilled that there's going to be a second vaccine. I know the talks are that they want to introduce that. Um, we welcome that because being the sole supplier of a vaccine in an unpredictable environment like uh, the DRC uh, is not easy. Um, so in, in, in closing on Ebola, I would say that, you know, the political unrest, the instability and war creates this unpredictable environment. Healthcare workers, as you know, have been actually killed. Many have fled. Uh, and you're also dealing, because of the fear, with isolated cases uh, that have fled without a trace, uh, given the, the situation and the war that's going on in the region. So just a different dynamic uh, altogether in dealing with, with that kind of response. Uh, lastly, what's on the horizon? Uh, I'll just mention one uh, in the pipeline in the context of building uh, confidence or building a more resilient immunization system. Uh, cytomegalovirus vaccine is one that we're working on. It's going to be a challenge. It's needed. We understand the uh, threats associated with newborns and the morbidity associated. Uh, however, this is going to mean vaccinating uh, mothers that are intent on having children. So given the current scenarios that we face with hesitancy, we know there are challenges. It's going to be even more challenging to try and convince people that this vaccine needs to be taken earlier so that people that are planning to have children uh, are protected or their children are protected. So finally, I'll wrap up. And uh, if Suzanne is here, I told you I'm going to tell stories about little children. She was very excited for the workshop. Um, Finally, I will end by saying that all of us here today uh, represent a community that has an important role to play in building and sustaining a resilient system, regardless of whether we are managing well established vaccination programs or preparing to launch new vaccines and new programs. If we think back to the stories of Anders, Rose and Grace, let's work together to build resilient systems and ensure that all individuals have the same opportunity to be protected through vaccination regardless of where they live. With that, thank you very much.